And welcome to another day of limbo-ish hiking in the desert. Last full day, though, if uh, everything works out. I got a little lazy last night. <clears throat> I put my water filter and my uh, toilet wipes and everything in my sleeping bag. I didn't bother to put my water bottles inside of my pack, though, which is usually how I keep them from freezing, so everything's a little bit icy. I had to use my spoon to chip through a uh, ice plug to make coffee. And this is the camp I came to last night. <laughs> I wanted to do more, and uh, walking down the road on that last section was a little easier, but I, I was beat by the end. I have basically been making dinner and then just passing out. It's nothing like the Black Range, but I have run afoul of a couple of uh, thorns out here. So if you hear any weird noises in the background, that's just the uh, ice sloshing around in some of my bottles. <laughs> My legs and feet have been complaining. <laughs> uh, you'd think I'd be tougher than this, but 25 mile days with what I'm carrying in the terrain has made for uh, pretty solid days. I was actually worried for a while yesterday because uh, the front of my shin started hurting. I was limping along with the hiking poles for a few hours. And that's all I need. <laughs> Some sort of other injury. So as of this morning, I am... 35.3 miles from the terminus at Crazy Cooks. That both doesn't seem like much and uh, still means I have what I hope is a full uh, 25 mile day today. And then uh, that'll get me to the monument mid afternoon ish the next day. Last night was actually nice because after uh, filling up at the cow occupied water source, I was on a road like this, so I was actually able to hike without kind of having to constantly go back and forth. While the trail does have footprints and you can see them pretty clearly in some of the video, you gotta understand that there's more than just the CDT trail out here, there's the trail. And if you can see the posts, that gives a pretty indi good indication of which one you want. But it's also crisscrossed by uh, cow tracks which also sometimes have footprints on them. So trivial during the day, kind of a pain at night. As far as where the trail's going, it is uh, skirting around the Little Hatchet Mountains, which are, are, I believe, right over there. And then that's probably the Big Hatchet Mountains. Again, it doesn't go straight over the top. It looks like it kind of curves around the side, which <laughs> Probably makes for faster hiking, but most of the really cool desert uh, hikes I've done have been, you know, peaks going up canyons and things. When you're in the wide open plains like this, it can be a little samey. Except right at dawn and dusk. Then it just gets pretty. I actually usually find it a lot more pleasant to uh, hike out in terrain like this with clouds. Just, uh tends to help the colors pop more. I find when it's just, you know, plain sun like this, it tends to make everything just kind of dingy <laughs> or blazing, depending on the time of year. As far as being excited about the whole Triple Crown thing, I am excited at some level. It honestly just hasn't really sunk in yet, if you can believe that on the uh, penultimate day. Mostly that's just because I've had to kind of keep myself from, uh, or try, I've tried to keep myself from contemplating the monument too much because this has been dragging up as is. And if I'm just constantly watching the miles tick down, that that's, makes it drag even more. I uh, am completely failing at hit, hitting my uh, hiker zen here. If anything, as usual, I'm... Uh, starting to dream about getting started in Delaware and just how cool that'll be crossing the country in a, such a different way on the American Discovery Trail. There have been multiple times on this trail where I have felt very, very excited about uh, finishing the Triple Crown. When I survived uh, Winter Park last year and the whole COVID thing, leaving there, I remember feeling like, okay, I, I beat that. <laughs> I'm going to finish this thing. Even if it's not ideal, even if I'm uh, not able to do all the red line, I should be able to finish. 
and then obviously the Noro thing and the post Noro attempt to come back. That all kind of killed that. This year, I was mostly stressing about the San Juans while I was in Colorado. When I got down around Abiquiu, I had started to feel pretty hopeful. Felt like I was in uh, New Mexico, things were leveling off. The winter risk was a lot lower. Yeah, I still had challenges ahead, but I had plenty of time. And then, of course, I promptly took a slip and spent three weeks off trail railing against the universe, constantly uh, worried that I wasn't going to be able to get back this year. <laughs> I didn't want to stretch this over two years, you know, much less uh, three. And honestly, if I'd had to exit again, if I have to exit again, could still happen. I wouldn't have time next year because of the... American Discovery Trail is one of those big throw hikes. So it would have stretched it out until 2025. So that's probably another reason why I'm feeling more impending relief versus, you know, overwhelming joy or anything. And like I've said before, I'm just, I'm not one for over the top monument shenanigans. I did really enjoy the first monument. When I finished the PCT, I hit it just perfect. Uh, because I was having some struggles, I actually stayed at Stahican, which is just a couple of days from the finish, for several days. And instead of finishing in the middle of a cold rainstorm, it, this was end of September, and Washington has a lot of cold rainstorms, I managed to finish in kind of a Indian summer sort of thing. I had snow on Rainy Pass, and then for Hearts, it was completely clear for the finish. When I got to the Terminus, there were a couple of people I knew there. Leo and uh, Flash Shenanigans was also there, the guy that was hiking in a bathrobe. And I was able to hang out there for a couple of hours. 2020 was one of the years the border was closed, so... I wasn't able to continue into Canada, which there was a lot of moaning about, but honestly, a 30-mile backtrack route to Hearts Pass really isn't that big of a deal, and it had the bonus effect of everybody who finished within a few days of each other got to uh, high-five on the way back, which was kind of fun. I got to see people that I'd been leapfrogging with for weeks and or months. I even uh, ran into Bilbo and Carew. And uh, Bilbo and LJ were the first people I ran into on trail, I believe. Basically, it was 2020, so I got to the monument. There's nobody around. All of those little towns were, you know, completely quiet. And when I was running over the hill to Lake Morena in the middle of 90-some degree heat, there were these two people kind of crouched over in the shade. I was pushing hard for Marina for water. So I think our, our first interaction was just kind of grunting a greeting to each other. And then uh, spent a lunch siesta with them a few days later. I started May 4th or 5th. So I was a late start and part of that is dealing with, you know, these 95, 100 degree heat waves in the desert. Well, that might sound really, really rough. And it was. And I'm never the biggest fan of uh, taking breaks in the middle of the day. It did have a lot of advantages. I originally did that because I was teaching the advanced mountaineering program, or I was supposed to be, <laughs> before COVID wrecked everything. And that was basically the day after my commitments ended there. But the thing that a lot of people don't realize about Southern California desert till they do it is, yeah, we're desert, but... <laughs> You go up over San Jacinto, and there, there's snow on a lot of those mountains. You know, look at uh, Microsoft was a 24-year-old guy who uh, died on the uh, traverse around Apache that year. So I've always kind of uh, leaned towards later starts when it comes to the PCT, particularly because when we went through the Sierra Nevada, you know, we got there when the snow was melted, 
and in spring, post snow melt spring conditions, which I, I've spent a lot of time over the last 15 some years up in the Sierra. Been up there in the winter, spring, fall, whole deal. Summer in the Sierra is the best time, if you ask me, once things kind of melt out and green up. And um, we didn't have to delay at Kennedy Meadows. I have talked to people who did an early start, got up to Kennedy Meadows, and then uh, had to jump off trail for seven weeks waiting for the snow to melt. I do teach a winter backpacking course. I have done plenty of snow trips. Trying to do distance in the snow was not uh, what I wanted to do, especially since Jen and I's goal, when, because she was with me then, leaving Kennedy Meadows South, was not to come out at Inyo or, uh, you know, Bishop, Lone Pine, things like that. You are in this spectacular part of the Sierra, you know, deep Sierra, and if you come out to Independence, Lone Pine, Bishop, you're basically doing a crummy hike up and over the pass versus staying in the really cool area. So we packed, you know, 10 days of food, whatever it was, and went from Kennedy Meadows to uh, Vermilion Resort. At that point, you're pretty strong because you've done the 700 miles of the desert. Actually, the bad thing about the Sierra Crossing wasn't, uh, you know, all the passes are pretty straightforward. You're on a well-graded trail the entire time. You get into some snow going over mirror, things like that. But in general, I love the Sierra and I find it a pretty gentle mountain range as long as you're uh, ready for the altitude. But I had an old pair of Lone Peaks, the uh, 2.5 or 3.5s, basically the ones that uh, used to actually last instead of fall apart. And I'd gotten those at Nomads in Idlewild and they basically started failing on me as I was going through the Sierra. Both sets of socks that I was rotating between ended up with holes. At one point, I found a pair of socks next to a uh, water crossing, because in those days, I was still taking my shoes and socks off for water crossings. <laughs> it, it was early days. I was trying to do anything I could to just patch things together. I wore the socks upside down until I put holes in that side also. It, it was fun. When I started the PCT, I didn't really have it in my head that I was gonna triple crown. I had been wanting to do the PCT for over 10 years. So the opportunity to actually do it was kind of, okay, I wanted to do the PCT. I figured maybe I'd do the CDT because it seemed like the CDT was wilder, et cetera, a little more along the uh, lines of what I come out for. I never thought I'd do the AT. Just coming from out west, the reputation of the AT is too many people, shelters, etc. And shelters and hostels aren't really compatible with my view of wilderness, I guess. But by the time I finished, as tends to happen with through hikes, it was such kind of a life-altering thing having done this, you know, big accomplishment that all of a sudden I, I was really excited to do the AT. I felt like, oh, hey, I've, you know, I've hiked 2,600 miles from Mexico to Canada. I can do this. I know what I'm doing. So all of a sudden that turned into wanting to do the Triple Crown and starting to plan the AT. And as it turned out, I started planning the Florida Trail as I was in my last couple of weeks on the PCT. And then I was going, I thought, okay, finish the Florida Trail. I'd have a little bit of a gap before it made sense to start the AT. I'm not a big uh, believer in these early starts. Some people do. So then go back home, then come back, and then do the AT. And then I found out about the Eastern Continental Trail. I think I ran across one of Jupiter's videos. <laughs> so I kept messaging Jen. It's like, okay, our plans for next summer, want to do the AT instead. And she had kind of expected that once I got into through hiking, I would want to do that over all other plans. There had been a nominal plan to go someplace, get my drive instructor rating, work for the summer, and then do another big hike, you know, the following summer. Which then, of course, turned into me messaging her say, oh, no, 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 WTC isn't happening due to COVID. I'm going to do the Florida Trail, come back, 
then do the AT, which then turned into, oh no, Key West to Canada. And I am still kind of amazed that that whole Key West to Canada thing worked out. I was three months to the day after finishing the PCT, AKA my first real long trail. And then I was down in Florida with barely a clue of what I was doing. <laughs> It, it was very different than coming off the PCT where everything's pretty, you know, straightforward. I was road walking through the Keys. It was during uh, the second round of uh, COVID shutdowns. I think it was the Delta variant or something like that. And Jupiter's videos did a pretty horrible job of representing what the Keys part was actually like. That was why I ended up doing these videos how I did because I was... Uh, a little bit embittered about uh, how he had represented them. So I just started taking little clips throughout the day and figured, well, I'll throw those in there. So even if I am misrepresenting it myself, at least I'll be able to show more what it was like. But yeah, a lot of things weren't open. Those that were open, like hotels, were extra expensive because I started at the end of December because I fell in love with the idea of three months to the day after finishing the PCT. The walking was right next to loud traffic, so I couldn't even do the audiobooks or any of my other tricks. And it, it just, it, the camping was so stressful. You know, I was stealth camping in bushes. I had a couple of times where lights hit me at night, which is always stressful. I didn't actually get rousted because I was careful, but it was the whole thing. I was getting eaten alive by no CMs. Weather was all over the place. Good times. Robinson Lake and Big Cypress were amazing, but in general, the Keys and the Everglades were a lot of really flat walking, and my feet were just melting down. I had some of the worst blisters <laughs> because you're not shifting your foot around. It's a constant flat surface, so the same spots are just getting hammered endlessly. So it seemed like everybody was having foot issues, even people that should have been hardened up. That did get a lot better north of Clewiston, where I got kind of into the wilderness management areas out there. And after a couple of weeks, I really started loving just kind of the Florida outdoors. The Alabama Roadwalk was surprisingly mellow outside of some dog issues. The Pinhoti was fun, especially since Jen joined me for part of the Alabama Roadwalk and started the Pinhoti. Pinhoti was just really chill outside of occasional dog issues and some road walks. Benton Mackay kind of woke up my legs because you start getting into the hills. And then once I was on the uh, AT, it, it was easy street for like the first half of the trail. I took a zero at Springer and then I didn't do another until Damascus. And even then I, I wasn't really feeling that drained or anything. A lot of people struggle with Georgia, Tennessee because, you know, they're just starting out. But if you're conditioned, the AT is seriously just such a nice, easy trail. I found it the easiest of the big three, even though uh, it is the steepest. So, I mean, you're climbing more, but that's just muscle. It beats you up. I was even able to survive it with my bad knees and all. Further up, I started dragging. The uh, rain was the big adjustment. I mean, we had hurricanes hitting us. It was whole thing. <laughs> and by the time I was up in Vermont, Maine, I, I was dragging and sometimes only doing like 11 or 12 mile days because of that. But Maine was really pretty. And I kind of rejuvenated going over Katahdin because I was excited for the IAT. And the IAT, I mean, it wasn't the best hiking objectively because it was a lot of roads and uh, ATV trails and things like that. But it was just a cool experience. It was different being up in Canada versus the US. The trees changing color were awesome. I met all sorts of awesome folks along the way. And it just lacked the uh, stress that I'd had on things like the Alabama Roadwalk. As a result, a lot of my more enduring memories are actually from those last couple of weeks hiking across Canada. The reason I did the AT second was I figured it would be 
anticlimactic to end on the less wild one. I thought the CDT would be the ideal thing to end on. And I mean, quite frankly, I think the AT would have been significantly more mind-blowing if I hadn't done the PCT right before. That's one of the best arguments I've heard for doing the AT first, because it kind of feels a little, at least to me, anticlimactic after the PCT was so just big, epic, and wild. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed the AT due to how easy it was to get into town, resupply, etc. I've commented that I think Jen and I just had more energy on that one than a lot of the others. Because if anything goes wrong, you can always find a hitch, a shuttle, or something and get into civilization. The fact that that trail, you know, has been platinum blazed, meaning somebody did the entire trail just doing 25 mile day hikes and staying in town every night, should kind of tell you it, it ain't remote. And of course, once the Key West thing was done, I was both kind of blown away. I'm still blown away that it worked out, that I actually managed to do that. And then there was nothing but come straight to the CDT the next season. And the frustrating thing is I feel like I prepared as well as I possibly could have. I mean, my warm up for the CDT, among other things, was Salton Sea to the Pacific Ocean and the Condor Trail. Tough trails. So when I got out to the CDT, I felt like, again, it was, it was actual trail. So even though there were big climbs and glacier, I felt really uh, fired up and ready straight out of the gate. There are always struggles any particular day out here. You know, there's always something. You're running low on something, you're not feeling well, you're feeling off. <laughs> You've got a big hill, you got a steep descent, it's raining, you know, yada, yada. But honestly, the CDT went pretty damn well outside of some foot issues. You know, I had to take some days off in Hamilton. I was struggling to find shoes that worked. And it didn't really de derail until Winter Park, where I went from firing on all cylinders, you know, determined to push through the San Juans, etc. And then I ended up uh, getting COVID. That cost me 10 days. I ended up uh, having ice storms, meaning I couldn't go up over Gray's because of that boulder traverse to Edwards safely. And then of course, once I got Noro down in Salida, that was kind of the end. Though, <laughs> of course I didn't accept that. I went all the way back to clean up for a couple of days. And then I was so determined to finish. I did, wasn't really realistic about how weak I was feeling. I figured, you know, after something like norovirus, your stomach's going to be off for a week or two before everything's fully back to normal. I thought I would be okay when I went back, and then I went back, and six miles a day was all I could manage, which makes those 15-mile water carries through that section fun. But, you know, overall, things went pretty well. Do I wish the CDT had happened in a single season? Yes. Though... I'm not sure if I'd trade monument to monument in a single season for being able to have done the red line. I, I was really dedicated to seeing the San Juans and, you know, the Black Hills. And some of those sections are the most iconic to me when I think about this trail. It was kind of cute just how terrified Jen was that I was going to cancel the Mississippi paddle trip and... Uh, insist on doing the CDT, you know, starting from the monument again. <laughs> Apparently I have a reputation for being slightly stubborn, you know. But I, I, I really wanted to do the Mississippi, and the Mississippi ended up being an amazing thing. And when I thought about starting back at the monument, while a clean hike appealed to me, everything north of Winter Park, there wasn't really anything where I felt like I missed out or would have done anything different. And this season, I could have lived without ever getting near Winter Park again. The injury was a bummer, but, you know, sometimes you just got to deal with uh, what the 
universe throws at you. And <laughs> it makes for another story. I do like having stories. I did enjoy getting to come back and fill in the red line that I'd missed. Even if Rocky Mountain wasn't really my favorite section of trail due to the burn area, it kind of felt like a waste. Grays and Edwards, it was cool to be able to do high point of the trail. You know, it's actually on the trail and not just a side trip. And of course, I just uh, love the San Juans and the Black Hills experience. The funny thing is when Jen and I really started digging into the CDT as a trail, we both got kind of freaked out because looking at the stats, if you assume the commonly quoted 3,100 miles, it, it, the weather window makes it really, really tight. I mean, I was not, even after I had done everything I'd done, I wasn't feeling confident that I'd be able to make it. Hence why I prepped so hard. I knew I needed to be making, you know, 22 mile days regularly. And I started skipping towns because, you know, that, that just eats time just trying to make it all the way through. Funny thing is, I had obviously seen people who were on the PCT, et cetera. I'd hiked around them. I had a feel for what sort of hikers they were. They had gone on and they completed the CDT, so I knew something was up. When I started, I was telling Jen that, you know, I get, I'll probably have to take alts. I was even initially open to Super Butte, which became the thing that I was, Super Butte slash Big Sky, which became the thing I was kind of the most dead set on pretty early. And that was pretty much just once I was actually out on the trail, the uh, comments from people constantly trying to game things, <laughs> you know, trespassing, doing all this stuff to just try and cut miles, cutting off pretty sections of wilderness in favor of roads and things like that. That started to bug me. There are a lot of comments on Far Out to that extent. And I mean, we did uh, Standing Bear, Spotted, Spotted Bear. Whichever one is not the AT druggy hangout, that, that's the one we did. Because it looked cool, it's like, oh hey, we would rather go high than stay low. And I did in one of the alts everybody talks about in the winds. But quite frankly, I mean, the alts are cool, but so's the red line. When I uh, bypassed Knapsack Call, which is one of those big uh, alts people talk about, the section that you don't get to see due to Knapsack was actually one of the prettier sections of the winds. You're up in this high lake basin. It was like a slightly less pretty Sierra, <laughs> which was my general thought of the winds, you know, as a thing anyway. And so from the point where we exited the Bob Marshall, I was pretty much, I, I wasn't dead set against doing any alts, but I felt like the research that I had did describe Yogi's old 2015 guide to the CDT was the big thing I found. It described the alts and made them sound kind of like it was go high or go low, go over here or go over here. And then once I was actually out on trail, it seemed like the majority of them weren't alts so much as shortcuts, which is why I used the term shortcut alt for a lot of these. Because so instead of swinging out and hitting some cool section of trail, you know, it cuts down a, a dirt road, a paved road, etc. And I ended up liking that. And of course, by the time I came back this year, I was pretty much dead set on redlining. I'm not calling myself a religious purist or anything when it comes to it, because, you know, there was some of the Colorado high country where I had to jump off the red line in parallel down in a valley because of weather. But I just wanted to not feel like I cheated myself. And had I done a lot of the shortcuts, I would be home right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, relaxing, eating lots of veggies, things like that, which sound rather nice at the moment, but I'm feeling a high sense of satisfaction with my version of the CDT here. I got to do over 3,000 miles. I got to do, you know, Butte, Idaho, the San Juans, the Black Hills. I did all those other little red line sections that 
it looks like so many people skip, you know, the lava field stuff like that, that was just kind of so unique. And a lot of the sections just, you know, up on the divide on those rolling hills where some of my happiest times just kind of existing out on trail, which is what I come out here chasing. At least where I am right now, I don't see myself redoing any of the trails, especially, you know, I tried to uh, do a couple hundred miles of overlap this year coming back to the CDT because there were red line bits and I just wanted to be out on trail, not jumping around constantly. And I remember this from the PCT, just how much I, how much less I enjoyed the sections where I already knew everything. Because going through the Sierra Nevada, it was beautiful. We were meeting neat people, you know, we were feeling strong, stuff like that. But I knew what was over every pass and around every corner. I actually perked up a lot when I got to Northern California, which is funny because NorCal is where uh, a lot of people break. NorCal blues, it's kind of like Virginia on the AT. But you know, it was different. It was starting to feel far from home. There was a little bit of a hit when I got to the halfway point at Chester and realized I still had 300 miles of California to go, but I like new things. I feel like if I went back to the AT or something, yeah, it would be fun, but after I settled in, just that, that sense of adventure and exploration, I guess, wouldn't be there. Same reason I don't look exhaustively into any of the trails I do. I do enough research to make sure I'm prepared for conditions that I know what the food carries are and things like that. And then <laughs> I enjoy discovering it as I go. I've only ever made it through a single trail documentary that I can think of. Actually, I take that back. So I watched uh, To Measure a Mile, which is a bunch of people just making every bad choice in the world <laughs> and paying for it but it at least doesn't try and hide that. So I stuck with that to the end. There's also some older PCT ones that I, I saw one of them being put together uh, at the zero day kickoff I went to way, way back in uh, like 2008, 2009. And I watched a couple of those because they do kind of capture the actual trail, not the uh, social media happy, happy sort of thing that is so prevalent. Funny thing, when I got, was getting ready for the PCT, I sent my parents a DVD of this National Geographic show on the Pacific Crest Trail. It had been uh, filmed when I was at the Zero Day kickoff. There's some shots of the big crowd, and if they had panned over a little bit further, you would have been able to see me in the background. But uh, turns out it was actually a really, really crappy documentary. It, it does the usual thing of making everything seem so dramatic. You know, it talks about the Sierra Nevada and it was doing flyovers of ridgelines that I'm not even sure were the Sierra Nevada. It certainly was not showing the trail. I asked mom about it and she was like, yeah, it, it wasn't that good. I was worried for a little while because they made it sound like it's super dangerous and everything. And then I realized the people that they showed hiking it were old and fat. And I figured, well, if they can do it, you should be able to do it. Of all three trails, the PCT was the one that I saw myself maybe doing again. I uh, had thought that going southbound might be fun. Problem is with uh, climate change issues out west, I don't want to get into something only to get completely shut down by fires once I reach Southern California. And that is unfortunately common. I also enjoyed the progression northbound on the PCT. Of all the trails, I felt like it had the kind of coolest zones. You know, it trains you up in the desert, forges you going through the Sierra. By the time you're in NorCal, you're feeling strong, you're dealing with issues, but you know, you're well into it. Then Oregon was just awesome and cruisy and struggle. And then uh, you've got Washington as that final kind of kick in the face, time limiter, start getting rain and snow. I've just talked to a lot of people since I did it in 2020. In 2020, you know, a few hundred people finished the trail instead of a few thousand. And 
I think the crowds would just be too much of a detriment to me. I like meeting people. I like hiking around people. But I chatted with somebody on the Arizona Trail this spring that had just come off the PCT. When I did it, I camped with somebody else three or four times the entire trail. They were the opposite. And it wasn't that they were always trying to camp with people. It's just there were so many people. Ironically, the crowds on the AT bothered me less, but I think that's just... Uh, the AT is better set up to handle it. And because so many of the newer folks get drawn into the shelter, since we were uh, macetators, the shelter haters, we would get to the shelter, we'd fill up water, we'd chat with people, you know, visit. And then we would go a couple other, a couple miles past and there was almost always some place to camp away from everybody. And, you know, with the outhouses and everything, you have less of the excrement everywhere sort of issues. Though in 2021, we did have somebody who was pretty obviously mentally unwell out there. When uh, we were going through like the 100 mile wilderness, there, there were uh, used toilet paper that was kind of like hung up in the bushes next to the trail. It was obvious somebody wanted people to be seeing it. Wait, nobody ever figured out who it was, but yeah, that, that was pleasant. Ironically, if anything, I could probably see doing the AT or part of the AT again, just because it is very different from a lot of what I've done out west. It's really easy logistically, and you can just screw around through hiking playground, you know? Nothing ever goes wrong, and you can always get to help. But at least for the foreseeable future, we are still adding plans faster than we're getting them done. So I, I wouldn't look to see us back out on any of those anytime soon. If there is another worldwide pandemic and, you know, a good amount of people stay home, maybe then I'll run out and do the uh, PCT. Seriously, I'm so grateful that uh, that worked out, that I ended up going, that it actually uh, felt responsible and safe to be out there. It, it was really rough being in SoCal in like March, watching the world kind of falling apart. The shutdowns happened and everything. People were bailing off of the uh, PCT. International people that had been out there were having to go home. And everything was sold at that point. We didn't have an apartment. We uh, didn't have that much stuff, you know. We were literally homeless. And uh, struggling even to find, when they shut the campgrounds down, struggling even to even find places to stay while everything was shut down. I know people that were out there in 2020 and absolutely hated it because they wanted more people around, but you know, it, it's just, it's what you're looking for. I was looking for wilderness and it felt wildernessy. I was still running into people most days. Every now and then I'd have a couple of days running in between other folks where it was just me, but it never felt like it was a giant conga line the entire way. I kept referring to the AT as the Katahdin Conga Line. So all in all, I guess that's my way of saying I uh, feel kind of blown away that I actually will be a uh, triple crowner sometime tomorrow if everything doesn't go horribly wrong. I was just waiting to see if I slipped and, you know, ripped something again right there. <laughs> I haven't been quite as in awe of triple crown status as I was when I first found out about it, just because like anything, the closer you get to it, the more flaws you see. You know, a college degree seemed like a really big deal back when I was a little kid, but when you're going through it and you see that, you know, people just skate by doing the minimum stuff like that, it starts to feel a little less of accomplishment. And same with the Triple Crown. There's been some, uh, not so minor kerfluffles online as somebody who has been, you know, old school, did the triple crown back in such and such a year, ends up drunkenly admitting at a hostel or something that, oh yeah, I didn't do that section, you know, I just, I took a car from there to there. And all of a sudden people who put so much into doing the trail just blew up. And stuff like that happens on all the trails. And of course, I mean, just look at the CDT. There are a good number of people who, oh yeah, I hiked the CDT on such and such a year. 
and they never saw Idaho. When I was in Doc Campbell's this spring, I was talking to somebody who was on the CDT at that point, you know, they're, I don't know, 150 miles in, something like that. Maybe a little more. And uh, they, they were having a conversation about how much they were allowed to skip, like if they took a car past roads, would that be okay? I mean, on the AT, people were talking about, well, the recognition is 2,000 miler. That means you can skip however many miles as long as you're <laughs> above 2,000 and all sorts of weird stuff like that. So in the end, the uh, triple crown thing means a huge deal to me, but I guess less as a community just because I know how much it varies. It is cool enough where I am going to submit for recognition on that. Uh, the individual trails, they often track completion. Of course, the PCTA uh, refused to acknowledge 2020 hikers, and the ATC didn't start acknowledging miles until after I was well into the AT. So uh, I have had no official recognition of my hikes, but I do want to put into the organization for the Triple Crown because this is kind of a big deal. I'm not a tattoo person, but were I a tattoo person, this would totally be tattoo worthy. The problem with that is, you know, if I got a tattoo for every big accomplishment, things that at the time felt like a huge accomplishment 10 years ago when it happened, you know, now it's like nothing. First time I did a hundred mile, uh, you know, endurance bike ride, I thought that was huge. And I was really into cycling for a while when I did all those bike centuries. And now it's like, oh yeah, that, that's cool. It's something I did, but I'm kind of glad I don't have an arm sleeve with all the cycling stuff, you know? Blame my lack of contentment. No matter how uh, cool the uh, tattoos would be, I would be unhappy with them eventually. I was looking around for Triple Crown merchandise when I was in town the other night. You know, it's kind of like when I fished the PCT, I got a PCT shirt. I've been trying to get the one cool looking... Uh, a t-shirt from seeking dry goods for like multiple years but it never comes into stock unfortunately a lot of the triple crown stuff is either badly done t-shirt shop style logos or it has the mileage on it and it looks like the typically quoted mileage for the triple crown is 7,900 miles and my version's over 10,000 I'm uh, quite happy and proud of that. <laughs> and I don't want to be running around in something that makes it seem like I only did, you know, 7,900. And that number is kind of bogus anyway, since it assumes a red line of the CDT, which almost nobody does. And like for me, when I seriously started looking at the AT, the AT bugged me conceptually because unlike the CDT and the PCT, it doesn't cross the entire country. It starts and stops very arbitrarily. Yeah, I know you can say, well, that's where the Appalachian Mountains start, but uh, Flag Mountain uh, would have a disagreement on that. And obviously the IAT continues along the uh, old Pangea range. So I, that was why I was really, really happy I was able to do the Key West up to Canada thing. So as far as when I talk about my Triple Crown, I'm counting 5,000 miles for the AT doing the extended version, 3,000 plus for the CDT. I haven't actually checked what I'm gonna finish up. I know I'm over 3,000 now. And then obviously uh, 2,653, I believe it was for the PCT. It has just been a really cool way to experience the country. This particular section, not the greatest experience, but you know, with the through hike, it, it's the overall kind of journey and how things change. I mean, I was in the snow a week ago up at 9,000 feet, <laughs> and now I'm walking through the desert and just that whole continuous footpath change going from one border to another is, is really cool. That was part of what, I, the part that I really enjoyed about the PCT. You know, desert scrub floor like this, and then ending up uh, in the Cascades. So of course, having been across the country four times, if you count the uh, Mississippi, Let's call it by uh, human-powered means. Of course, now I'm excited to do uh, east-west. I really enjoy the mental concept of distances that hiking across the country has given me. So looking forward to the same thing, east and west. And I kind of assumed it was uh, 
longer. I think that's mostly due to just the way map projections work, but I had this concept that east-west across the United States was a lot longer than it actually is, even with the uh, longer route that I'm taking, because basically the ADT has a north and a south branch for some reason. South branch goes through Colorado, that's also the longer one, but it goes straight through the town where my parents live, so... I, I gotta go do that one. Ironically, I am less confident that I can do it than I was after finishing the PCT, but I guess that's just how it goes. It's that uh, confidence graph thing. You learn a little, you feel super confident. You learn more, you realize how much you don't know. And just the, uh, the different challenges across the different trails, the different seasons, conditions, etc., has uh, been eye-opening. So assuming those are the big hatchet mountains, I mean, the finish isn't very far on the other side. That haze is probably the haze you get from uh, northern Mexico. Oh, I gotta love the desert. Walking along on a road thinking I can make good time, and then there's these little uh, screw you uh, ravines everywhere. Come on, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Terminus has got to be out there because you come out the uh, south side of the big hatchets and you cut a left. And at that point, you know, it's like 10 miles away. Just me and the deer out here. And that is the sort of desert peak I usually like going up. I don't know that I'll ever be uh, back down this way with time to spare, but look at that. Hey guys. Okay, apparently it's me, the deer, and the very horny cows. So the pavement here can actually be used to uh, access the cheetah. AKA you can get on the trail and if you really don't like being on the trail, you can go camp in town instead. <laughs> I have seen some traffic as I was coming down the hill. And apparently if you hitch to Hachita, they have some sort of a store with burritos and ice cream and stuff like that. I don't know. Even if I was northbound, I tend to be so excited to be out here. All I want to do is be away from all of that civilization stuff. And welcome to the second to last water cache. Should be third to last, but uh, apparently somebody stole the models out of the terminus. It is awesome that these are out here, but this has to be some of the worst tasting cash water I've ever had. It, it's got a serious tang of plastic or something. So that's talking about that well I went to last night, and that was quite tasty. There is a solar well in about another 13 miles south. Might see if I can get there. So normally when not water is not so great, I use these. I actually use these even when the water does taste good. It just helps me drink them faster. However, when things get really nasty and I have to choke down water that has a taste, it's hard to beat this stuff. <laughs> Found out about it in Florida where I was having all that uh, sulfury water. Also, if you're somebody who's bothered by, you know, silly things like tannins in water, this hides that. I was really struggling to get that water down. <laughs> even with the mix. Oh well, I guess that uh, helps it last longer. I have about a half a liter left from the uh, cow well last night and I decided to save that. I don't know what I'm saving it for, but at least I know I have some clean water. I'm gonna climb up the side of this range. Looks like it's single track all the way down to the far side. And in 11 miles, there is another water cache. So nominally, that's what I'm aiming for. There is one solar well a couple of miles past that. I am uh, tempted, quite frankly, to blow past the cache and go to the well, but uh, it does look like it's going to be a ways off trail. And of course, because winter is terrible, I am down to only five hours of daylight. <laughs> so there's uh, basically no chance of making that well in daylight. I mean, the one last night was uh, fun with all the eyes watching me from the dark. <laughs> from comments, it looks like I might have missed the uh, last AT&T cell tower 
Though, part, <clears throat> part of the reason why we have AT&T in the plan we have is our phones will actually work in Canada and Mexico. So often, once I'm down by the border, I'll start picking up one of the uh, Mexican companies' cell towers. And of course, as always, I have uh, Jen to relay things when I ping her via inReach. I sent her a message this morning saying, uh, go ahead and ping the guy who offered to pick me up. Confirm with him tonight when we see how far I get, but it's looking uh, pretty solid for finishing on the 11th. 25 miles to the border. <laughs> and if this was uh, faster going, I think I would just blaze it straight through. Unfortunately, uh, you can kind of see I'm having to go back and forth. Uh, there is a post out there, but there hasn't been a super clear trail. Up ahead is also the very first slash last of the uh, shortcut halts. Actually, this one's more of an alt alt. Uh, there's a blue line that follows a road instead of the uh, apparently single track. And yes, these are all thorn bushes, as I keep getting reminded whenever I'm not careful and I brush one with my leg. <laughs> Though, quite frankly, after the uh, locust bushes from uh, the Black Range. These are downright friendly. This could be going a little better. <laughs> At least I've got a trail again for a good number of miles there. It was basically just cross country with these occasional posts. If I'm going to hit my goal, I still have another eight miles or so. And this has been uh, slow going. It's almost four o'clock too. I had pretty much settled on bypassing the cache and going on to the uh, stock well since uh, the water I drank at that last one hasn't been sitting overly well with me. Just too plasticky. But yeah, I, uh, I don't know here, because it's going to be dark within two hours. I'll be lucky if I'm clear of this. Hey, little guy. Don't mind me. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking this morning how my <laughs> wounds from the Black Hills had just healed. Oh, well. This has actually been a much happier day for whatever reason. I've actually been losing myself in the hike, aside from all the thorns and everything. So I'm currently about 16 miles from the end. Basically, I go through that canyon, pop out the other side, and then there's a short section. Still hoping, uh, assuming I can get on better trail by the time the sun goes down, to knock out about another five or six tonight. I'd rather have 10 in the morning because uh, that'll finish me pretty easy by, you know, one o'clock, noon. Okay, finish the, uh, Hard to follow section. <laughs> A little later than I wanted, but uh, yeah. So the water cache I was looking at is a uh, short way down the blue line behind me. If I go 1.7 up this though, there's Stoddard Well. And <laughs> like I was saying, I uh, the water tasted bad enough out of the cache. I would kind of rather get it out of the cow well. It'd be a shame to have my last night, you know, have foul beans and uh, bad coffee. From here, it's 13.7 to the border. I know, almost close enough for me to just <laughs> put my head down and do it, but uh, the views, you know? This canyon would probably be much cooler if it was still daylight. Had quite enough of wandering around in the dark lately. This was a little more complicated to get to than I expected. And it's a ways off trail, but oh well. 
Now if I can just get through the vegetation, huh? So there is good water here, though I'm uh, pretty sure that's a dead bat. Okay, that worked. Climbed the ladder, got water out of the inside. Didn't drink dead bat that I know of. And now, time to get back to trail and uh, find a camp. Got water, came a little bit further down. I'm a little under 12 miles from the uh, terminus. And I'd rather uh, do this canyon in the morning when I can enjoy it, so. Hard to believe I'm so close, it's at long last. Uh, yeah, looking forward to tomorrow. Looking forward to a hot dinner at the moment. It is actually quite cold in this canyon, so uh, that's why I put the rain fly on, give me a little bit extra warmth. And home sweet home.